Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, my name is John Norman. I am the moderator for today's webinar in which we are exploring perspectives on generative chemistry, the potential and the reality. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined uh, for this presentation by Nicholas Stiefel, Director of Data Science at Novartis, uh, Philip Chung, Scientific Informatics Software Consultant at Collaborative Drug Discovery, and Matt Siegel, CEO at Optibrium. Uh, the group will be discussing if advances in AI and deep learning have reached a threshold whereby generative chemistry methods are now redefining drug design. And uh, we will be presenting their experiences of method development, real life application, and the latest advances being made. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to uh, join my, uh, my friends uh, Nick Stiefel and, and Philip Chung for today's uh, webinar uh, and to see so many people in the audience today. Um, let me begin by introducing uh, our other panelists. Uh, so Nick Stiefel, um, he joined Glaxo Welcome in 1999 for a one-year internship to learn more about what computer-aided drug design and chem informatics means. And in 2000, he started his PhD studies in the lab of Newt Baumann in Würzburg, and he was actually his uh, first PhD student. Nick's main interest was and still is QSAR and molecular descriptors, as well as statistical validation. Nick spent his postdoc year with Eli Lilly, focusing on the implementation and application of reduced graphs for virtual screening and drug discovery. After joining Novartis in 2005 as a research investigator, Nick is now director of data science, leading a team of experts in machine learning and is project lead owner in a variety of technology project projects with global teams and cross organizational impact. Uh, Philip Chung uh, started his drug discovery career in the 1990s as well, teaching robots how to do biology, building automation for drug discovery companies and academic institutions like the Institute for Systems Biology. He later moved on to work at Pfizer, where he helped build the Crystal Structure Database and the structure-based drug design tools still used by Pfizer today. He later moved into the computational biology space, where he supported projects in cancer and ophthalmology, including a natural language processing project that repositioned drugs from other indications into ophthalmology. After Pfizer, he moved on to DART Neuroscience, where he led the computational biology group for 10 years. And for the last four years, he's been in the research group at Collaborative Drug Discovery, where he's been working on more machine learning tools. So thank you both for joining us today. And I should add for those in the audience who uh, aren't familiar, uh, my name is Matt Siegel. Uh, I'm the CEO here at Optibrium. Um, I've been working in the space of uh, computational drug discovery now for far too many years, as you can tell from the lack of hair in my picture. Uh, but uh, I uh, helped to co-found Optibrium in 2009, and we've been working on predictive modeling, decision analysis, uh, data visualization, and AI methods and drug discovery ever since. In terms of an overview of today, um, we're going to be addressing the question of whether advances in AI and deep learning have reached a threshold whereby generative chemistry methods are, are redefining drug design. Uh, Nick is going to start by, building an, by talking about building and applying generative chemistry platforms. Uh, Phil will talk about some novel machine learning models that he's been working on. Uh, and I'll talk about approaches for guiding generative methods in drug discovery. But before we get on to the sort of formal part of the presentation, I thought uh, maybe we should set the scene by just asking the question about uh, what is generative chemistry? And so, uh, Nick, maybe you could start with your perspective. Sure. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for the nice intro. So, yeah, I think that's it's it's an interesting question because I think generative chemistry is really something different for everyone. Um, when you when you talk to some folks, people are thinking about, um, you know, MMP based enumerations, reaction based enumerations, really hardcore, you know, manual de novo design an empty pocket and then you can start building. And then, you know, more lately, and I think this is also mostly what we're talking today about is this, let's say machine learning driven uh, generative approaches, which are not using any prior knowledge in terms of reactions or so, uh, but really this, you know, building up either motive based or atom based compound by compound. So for me, the main distinction in, in, in what we have or what we're talking about today compared to what was there before is, you know, in, in one space, we are mostly picking up things that are more based on existing chemical matter, be it building blocks or, you know, fragments that were used in other compounds before. And, and you know, the 
ML-based approaches, be it GAN or encoders or whatever, um, provide us you know, with, with things which are outside the usual chemical space, which has its pros and of course also has its cons. Thanks, Dick. And maybe, Phil, you could you talk a few words about what you see as the difference between generative chemistry and de novo design methods? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Nick. I think he totally nailed it on the head. Uh, using prior knowledge is a you know big part of de novo design, having large fragment libraries. So when we used to do it, uh, you know, you start with an empty pocket and then you're adding fragments in that you think are going to do well, and then you start connecting things together. Uh, the biggest problem we always saw was we'd always be creating molecules that um, med chemists would say, oh my gosh, I, I can't build that. And so, uh, you know, taking a generative platform and then adding on uh, synthetic feasibility and, you know, uh, being able to filter out compounds and, you know, highlight compounds that are more synthetically feasible has been a large focus of our, uh, of our efforts as well. Yeah, that's a, a really important point. And, and I guess from, from my perspective, I was uh, at a very interesting session at the European Federation of Medicinal Chemists uh, a few weeks ago now, where talking about similar methods. And, and, and I think there was a lot of discussion about the difference between sort of machine learning based methods and um, also the more sort of chem informatics based approach that, that Nick, Nick referred to. Um, whether that classes as generative chemistry or not, I don't know. But, uh, but certainly, I think there's still an opinion that these chem informatics based approaches can add a lot of value. Um, whereas I think, as Nick said, the uh, generative, the more sort of uh, speculative machine learning approaches can access sort of new and different chemical space as well. So um, yeah, it, it, it's a real mixture of opinions and, and definitions, but, but hopefully that sets the scene a little bit. And with that, perhaps I'll hand over to you, Nick, um, and uh, hand over to your presentation here. And you can perhaps start by describing your experience of, of building a generative chemistry platform and what you've learned from the initial applications to drug discovery projects. Sure, thanks a lot, Matt. And yeah, um, thanks for having me. I, I will try, let's say. I, I see this more as a warm up for, for Phil and you afterwards, uh, because I guess I will be more trying to reach out on, on some of the, I said applications, but also maybe some of the philosophical and psychological uh, aspects of what I think are actually really important when it comes to these things. Um, so when we think about GenChem, in, in, in principle, actually, it's, it's the same as a MedChem optimization. In the end, what we want to do, uh, you know, we, in MedChem optimization, you go from a non-optimal compound and you want to somehow, whatever that magic black box is in the middle, um, come to an improved compound. And depending on, you know, what the, the difficulty of your target is, you will have different now, for specifics of your target, will have different parts of your MedCom optimization. And, you know, in GenCom, it's actually not too different. We use sometimes a bit different words. You know, we have a non-optimal seed. And, and the seed word I will use more often. That's why I kind of want to highlight it. And then you encode this into a latent space. And that latent space is defined by what's called the generator models. And I guess that Phil will go more in-depth into this later. And it's actually you start with a point um, which is, you know, given a certain um, multi-objective profile that you want to achieve, not optimal, and then use predictive models and kind of to traverse this space, search that space for a better point, which then gives you another latent vector, and then you decode this into an improved compound. So this is a very high level. This is what the black box is in, in GenCam. Of course, there's much more to it, but this is uh, maybe the intro. So what we have done very briefly on technology, if you want, we work together with Microsoft and um, there's a, a, a scaffold aware generator called MOLA that's been published and there's a great paper from Chris from Microsoft that, that's uh, in archive. And how this roughly works, if, if you think about this latent vector that, you know, that's this point in this space there, for the decoding there's essentially three important steps and I don't want to go in depth, but in the end what we have is we start with a scaffold and then we predict, or we start from completely empty, essentially then we predict what is the next node to connect? And that next node can be either an atom or a motif, where a motif is something, you know, a, a functional group, let's say a piperazine, a piperidine, a pyridine or whatever. And then essentially we, we score what could be the next edge or the next bond that you connect and then essentially where you connect it. So this is very high level. The good thing about having this mix of atom by atom and motif by motif buildup is that we can go very far out with exploration, um, but also still create a lot of uh, chemically valid molecules. So, of course, now there are many ways to approach the novel design, and this comes a little bit back to our discussions or intro that we had before. You know, what is GenChem, if you want? So we have the molecule generator. I will not go through all the details of this of this slide, but you see, and I kind of separate this out into generative models, which are more um, learning-based, and then you know, enumeration-based or chemoinformatics-based models. And I think they're 
all of those are super important and you know by combining them probably we'll get the best of all worlds essentially then we have a search algorithm to to traverse the space and then also those scoring function and the search objectives and i think these are also super important because in the end you know initially when you had optimization it was or it is mostly still around qsa models admin models essentially simple or simpler 2d models but more lately we see much more you know things around binding pocket constraints stocking scores scaffold constraints and so on um what this is allows us then to do um, thousands or hundred thousand of molecules. And then for us at the moment, the most efficient way of, of saying a little bit what Phil said, you know, getting the right compounds out of this mess of, of, of compounds is really get a post-processing process uh, steps that essentially allow us to get all the MedCam project knowledge in. And that's really dependent on the project. But in the end, we need to get down hundreds or maybe thousands of promising molecules, which are synthesizable, that have a certain profile, that maybe fit into the pocket, that do not have the substitutions in the wrong point. And that's something we are still learning. One thing that is very important is that is that exploration and exploitation piece, because I think there's also a lot of issues with that space. When, when you look at a lot of people have the perception of generative chemistry when they hear about it the first time or read about it the first time. You know, this gets us from compound A to compound Z, where, you know, this Z is completely different to A. At the same time, you know, it's going to be the next drug. And we do this, you know, in a very short time. Um, and then on the other hand, we have the exploitation part, which is maybe more around, you know, we have a series of compounds. We want to find the optimal um, space where this, this uh, compound sits in. And that discrepancy in expectation, I think, is actually something really important. And we'll go a bit deeper into this because this is essentially kind of some of the learnings that we have what, where things are actually good. Because otherwise, you know, we see those shiny headlines and that, you know, will influence what people think about GenChem. And then the, uh, the sobering, essentially, truth, um, the actual successes, which are much more in the space of exploitation. And I think that's, that's really an important one. So let's do some expectation management. First of all, GenChem is really not the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. I mean, it's nice to think that, but in the end, it's a new methodology, which is maybe not even so new anymore, right? It's an um, extension of what we've been doing with chemoformatics approaches for a while. So in the end, if you cannot solve the problem overall in your project, and your new method will not just change this. So if you, if you want to use GenChem, just make sure for the issues at hand, do you have really the relevant models? And with that, the relevant assays, and do the assays actually define your endpoint that is relevant for your phenotype? Do you have the relevant data to actually build those relevant models? And if not, you know, do you have the ways to generate this relevant data? And and you know, only if these things kind of things kind of work for you and your project, then it's actually you know good to use this. And I want to give you a couple of examples why this is the case, what we learned, right? So let's come up with a, a couple of specific expectations, but maybe especially on these, these caveats and the approaches around how to resolve some of that. I, there's a lot of truth which goes across all the different examples. So I don't want to go into all the details, but in the end, it's a lot about where do you start and where do you want to end up with? You know, How much novelty do you actually need? And that drives essentially how applicable are your models? If you run out of the applicability space, you are in deep trouble. And the problem with this is that you can generate you know, hundreds of thousands of molecules easily, but then you know you want to have a certain amount of risk um, related to your return of investment of making a compound because making a compound we all know is is time consuming and it's reasonably expensive, and all these things have to be taken into account. And some approaches to get around this is really include more target information, so the project specific knowledge, and we see more approaches now coming that take 3D into account. Um, but that's not the only thing, right? So. Let's go over some of the expectations quickly. Um, first one is uh, what we heard quite a bit. I have something that is active, give me something radically new that's also great. Um, let's look at this example. It's an antihistamine from the 30s and then you know a, a later generation antihistamine from the late 70s. If you show this to a medicinal chemistry project team, they say, you know, going from left to right might be possible, but not in you know, in not in a straight line. You need quite a bit of optimization in between. And even if you would show this and say like, oh, this is your next compound, you know, how do you pick this one out of hundreds of thousands of molecules? So honestly, on this one, I would say, you know, it's a no way question. The other one, next one, expectation, have something active, give me something better. And, you know, keeping some structural elements, ibuprofen and indomethacine. So you here, see here this, this pharmacophore in both of the molecules, more or less. And then, you know, that's doable, but tricky. It really depends, again, on how far do you want to go from distance? Uh, so what's the distance from start to end? One thing you can do in these cases is that because you will stay somewhat close, 
And we've implemented this a, a little bit now. We're just in the process of really including more on model uncertainty estimation. And Matt has a long history in model uncertainty estimation, so we'll not go down this, this route. Um, so then the other example that I have expectation-wise is um, I had a very much advanced series that has issues. We tried everything already. You know, let Gencam come up with the magic bullet. So if you want, this is your desperate sen scenario. And again, you know, you want to optimize one space. It can be anywhere from tough to doable, again, depending on how much you have to change. And the last example is really, this is the sweet spot. You, you have a series, you want to leverage GenCam along with the team ideas to really get to a better candidate. That's reasonable. And really the key thing here is that apart from the usual project caveats, get your team alignment right. You can include things like active learning and idea pooling, but it's really also about um, definition of novelty. So the bottlenecks we had in our platform is really it's adoption um, because you know we cannot show yet that this is working. Platform readiness. So for us, we were too slow in the in the initial beginnings, and then project selection, especially late stage project, projects, have the problem you know that models might not really be doable because we don't have enough data. And um, there are structures outside the norm. I come back to this in a second. And you know, there's also the the engineering piece, the integration of the established technologies, on, be it CAD or Kix, is really important. And you know, some of the problems we had were actually driven by how we started all of this. So I want to go through three projects with one example each, briefly. So first of all, the question we ask is, you know, can we explore new chemical space? Here we have a UMAP of um, active compounds colored by activity, and you see we have different clusters. The question was for us, if we have those seeds, can we fill the space in between? And on the right-hand side, you see molar and CDDD and different colored, and you see they both are able to essentially cover this additional space in different ways. And for us, that was a good sign because we could see that depending on the settings and the different embeddings, we can have different exploration profiles. The next project um, is these, uh, if you want, you know, the, the out of the norm compounds, right? What we find is that our standard procedures to remove, let's say garbage and not so good compounds with substructure flags and so on doesn't work because we see a lot of compounds that have zero alerts um, but they have things like, you know, repeating motives of hydroxys. We have three or four hydroxy groups. We didn't have this in our filters. There was really something we called gremlins, you know, large rings, reactive compounds, very ugly things that you cannot show to a chemist. And again, we, we were not able to capture those. And also things like very small, highly constrained rings for that specific project. So we need to optimize our methods, existing methods, to GenChem overall. But it's not all doom and gloom. So there are also some successful designs that I wanted to share. Um, so this is here, we have a project with a very constrained um, target product profile. Um, we had some seed inputs. And here we have now a GenChem specific chemistry team. Um, so a lot of thanks to Solane and Eve. And essentially what you see here is that we had from initial creation to selection was already one, let's say a week or one and a half. Then we have from chemist team selection and team prioritization, two or three weeks. Then we had another three or four weeks for compounds being made and tested. We had some really good profiles, so these things look good, but when they came out, people said, oh, this is nice, but actually, you know what? The project has moved on already quite a bit, so they're not outstanding anymore. They would have been if we would have done this in a week's time. So we can show that this works, but it also highlights, you know, the caveats that we need to take into account. So very briefly, take home messages. Do not expect magic um, from what we do. Uh, we want to be on par with human experts. Um, the impact expectation have to be really defined. GenChem is still new, right? We have basic approaches and we need to extend them based on, on project applications. There's a lot of stuff that we need to do in addition to GenChem, right? Not just the generators, property and activity models, 3D synthesis, uh, generators, MPO scoring, and so on. So there's a lot of work ahead. And one of the key things is seamless integration. Only if we can get these things together, we believe then we will have success. If it's just generative chemistry as such, uh, we don't believe really that this will be a game changer, let's say. So, of course, there's a lot of people. A lot of people here provided input. So it's not the whole team, but really a lot of people providing input. And I want to thank everyone. And, and thanks um, for the people who invited me today. And back to Matt. Um, so, yes, thank you, Nick, for a, a fascinating overview and, and showing us some of the challenges in the application of GenChem to, to the projects you've been working on. Um, and now I'll turn to Phil. Um, and just to say, first of all, it's been a real pleasure to collaborate with you and your colleagues on a really novel approach to generative chemistry and compound optimization. So uh, maybe, Phil, you could share with uh, everyone in the audience the goals of your project, uh, the methods you developed, and the, um, the fantastic results that you've achieved. Thank you for the great introduction and having us here. 
Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our efforts into moving into generative chemistry. And, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to highlight from what Nick was saying is that it's definitely not a magic bullet. It's a hypothesis generator. It's a tool, uh, you know, to help your med chemists come up with new ideas and help them move faster, uh, show them opportunities that maybe they uh, wouldn't consider as a first initial uh, step, but then they could like, you know, if they all of a sudden realize that, hey, this is a generated compound that actually is, uh, can be synthesized in a simple one-step process, or maybe it's um, uh, something that's actually commercially available, then maybe we can um, go ahead and just purchase this and put it into the pipeline to get some more SAR data uh, in parallel with our current project efforts. Like I said, nothing comes from one person. What do you call it? We've had uh, assembled a really great team over here at CED to help us. Uh, not quite as large as Nick's team, but uh, definitely, uh, what do you call it? I think uh, a great team. So Alex Clark uh, is our in-house in uh, cheminformatics expert. He's been uh, doing cheminformatics for over 30 years now and uh, worked at uh, CCG. Uh, some of you guys might be familiar with an old tool called Mo that he worked on. Uh, Mike is our in-house uh, deep learning expert. He uh, actually comes from the finance side and uh, has over like 30 years of finance and has started multiple companies in the machine learning area. Uh, Peter has uh, his 30 years over at, uh, uh, Novar uh, I wanna say Novartis. Uh, hopefully I get that right. My apologies, Peter, if I, if I put you at the wrong company. And then uh, Ben was at Optibrium um, and he was a, a, their key AI person. He's over now at Microsoft. Uh, but he's, uh, what do you call it? He did a tremendous amount of work in helping us uh, iron out any bumps that we ran into. Uh, Rachel and Yeet, of course, are younger, uh, and they helped out with this uh, Harvey Mudd College Clinic program, um, where we actually went off and did some more, uh, I would say, high-risk models, uh, which were just going to give us some more, uh, our next generation core doc, core fix core docking models. So that was really exciting. And then um, Ben was instrumental in um, helping us um, in license a lot of our uh, synthetic uh, chemist feasibility uh, software. So that was really great. And of course, I want to thank Matt and uh, Adrian and Alex, the team at Optibrium, who've been, you know, coming to the meetings every week to help us out. And then Barry, of course, our CEO, whose, you know, whose idea was to push this project forward to begin with. So the plan today is to basically kind of cover in more detail uh, the stuff that Nick was talking about. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we can create an autoencoder that can map molecules into uh, this latent space. Uh, we're going to call them chemically rich vectors. And then we're going to talk about the second step, which is where we take these uh, chemically rich vectors and we can actually use them as descriptors uh, to create uh, property prediction molecules. And then we're going to talk about how we can move around in latent space to try to find better uh, chemical vectors that you know, uh, that can predict the property better. And then the magic uh, sauce in all this is how do we go from a magic uh, chemical vector back up to a molecule? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So in the first step, uh, what we did was we wanted to get a machine and in machine learning, everything is kind of represented by long uh, vectors of numbers. And so in this case, uh, our CRV is actually 384 numbers. And so, you know, when you want to build an autoencoder, what you want to do is you want to start with something. Uh, maybe it's a picture, or you know, in this case, it's a molecule. And we want to actually have the machine translate it into a long vector. In this case, it's 384 numbers. And then we want to have the machine decode it so it can actually create itself back out. So the first time the machine does this, it fails horribly. It just, you know, generates like something that doesn't, you know, even look like a molecule. Uh, but after you do it a few billion times, the machine actually learns uh, that, you know, I can go ahead and start going from a compound to a vector and then back out into the compound. And the easiest way to think about kind of what's going on is that it's kind of doing embedding. <clears throat> and what it's doing is taking molecules and mapping them into this 384 space. And then, you know, as it's, you know, collecting more and more molecules and it sees more and more molecules, it starts clustering these uh, molecules together. But there's something very special about these uh, 384 dimensions that the machine is like prioritizing uh, that allows us to uh, actually go from a molecule to a number and then back to a molecule. And so what we fit, we hypothesized was that, you know, eventually there's the machine has, you know, discovered something so important about these 384 molecule uh, descriptors that we can actually use them as descriptors in, um, in predictive models, right? So we trained our model up 
And we eventually, uh, you know, we started using uh, all of uh, Kemble to train it. And we ran ahead and, uh, you know, started with a maximum of 75 atoms and we got rid of the large macromolecules and like all we came up with our model called Xenops. And it took us about 230 million uh, back and forths in that model you saw uh, on 1.6 million compounds. And it, you know, we had a bunch of criteria on what we thought would be a good model. And I'll, I'll kind of go through those in the next couple of slides. Uh, but, but eventually it got to the point where it got good enough that we figured we'd go ahead and file a patent on it. And so we went ahead and filed a patent on the next slide I'm going to show you, which is our uh, model design. And so in this case, what we're doing is we're starting with a molecule. And for each molecule, um, it's made up of lots of atoms. And so for each atom, we uh, go ahead and uh, come up with 160 encodings uh, values for that. And then we take those and we build a graph out of it. And then we build uh, and we run it through a convolution, uh, graph convolutional neural network, uh, which allows us to then uh, generate our latent vector. And so this, at this point, you know, you're starting from a molecule, you build a graph out of it, and that's a bunch of a, what do you call a matrix, but then you got to reduce the matrix into 384 uh, space. And that's kind of what's happening here. So this is the encoding portion. And then what happens is that we take the latent vector and then we combine that with an RNN and we kind of come back out. And this is when we come back out using uh, our RNN to come back up to a smile string, which represents the compound. And so in this case, we have three different types of losses. The key losses that we want to talk about is basically coming back out into a fingerprint and then coming back out uh, and minimizing our no log likelihood error, um, which is the error associated with the smile generation. And so using these two uh, you know, layers in our network, we're able to now you know, train up a model that allows us to you know, take in compounds and then actually generate the compounds back out. We had a couple of goals we wanted to hit when we were uh, doing this. We wanted to make sure that we, we tested it on a real compound. So we took 3,500 compounds from the Drug Central database. And then we went ahead and uh, wanted to see if we could actually encode and then decode them. And we showed that uh, in over 84% of our uh, compounds were able to like bring back a compound that was at within 0.9 uh, cosine similarity. And then uh, we set ourselves a goal that we want to create it efficiently. So we end up creating, you know, real smiles. We trained a non-life log likelihood uh, model up well enough that we were able to get correct smiles in 87% of the cases. And finally, you know, we wanted to make sure we could do this quickly, like uh, so that users could have a real-time environment where they could actually, you know, start with a compound, you know, ask for new compounds, and then get new compounds back within a few, uh, you know, a few minutes. And in this case, what we did was we came up with the model. It actually, you know, ran within, you know, five or six seconds. Uh, but then, you know, if you want to generate a thousand compounds, that's like five or six seconds times a thousand. So we went ahead and encapsulated that uh, generator onto Lambda, and basically you can run it in parallel. And so in this case, you can easily generate hundreds of compounds in seconds. So we're really excited about that. So once we had our, you know, ability to create our latent vector. Uh, we want to use these CRVs, so I'm going to use the term CRV and latent vector interchangeably here. So we want to use these latent vectors as descriptors now to create property prediction molecules. And so the idea is that, you know, you can start with a bunch of compounds. So here we have a bunch of smile strings, which represent compounds. And then we have a bunch of properties, right? And what you want to do is be able to build a predictive model. And so instead of using like a traditional descriptors, which might be like a number of hydrogen acceptors, number of, number of uh, hydrogen donors, you know, total, uh, total polar surface area. What we do is we use the uh, 384 dimensional space that was uh, identified by the machine. And then we can use this in a light gradient boosting model, which is just a, it's like a random force, but you know, a different type of machine learning model. And um, you can go ahead and create a predictive model that now allows us to, you know, given any point in latent space, what will be, be the predictive property? Uh, for that. And so we went ahead and we wanted to test it. And we want, one of our goals is that, you know, these uh, descriptors that the machine selected should be as good as the descriptors that are, you know, commercially available. And so here we went ahead and took 50 data sets from the binding DB. And we went ahead and just generated uh, what our predictive model R square would be in comparison to uh, Optibrium. And so in the blue, in the green is the uh, Optibrium. And then in the yellow is our Xenoms model. And then we had one other model we were evaluating, which is the, uh, the Herbert model. Uh, 
but you know, I can see here that we're basically paralleling the uh, the Optibrian uh, descriptors, which was very exciting for us because you know having machine pick the descriptors for us uh, gave us a lot of hope that you know we could do some other cool things as well. So the next step, right, is now that you have your compound, uh, as Nick was pointing out, what you want to do is you want to find out where that compound sits in the CRV space or the latent space. And you want to now, now that you have these predictive models, you want to be able to kind of search through that latent space to identify uh, how uh, new points in space with improved properties. So in this case, we're only working in the ke rich chemical vector space. We're not working in chemical space. And so we provided three different algorithms to, uh, to explore that space. Uh, the genetic algorithm is the one that allows you to kind of leapfrog a little bit further away. Um, what it does is it actually generates uh, new CRVs and then you know does a, a cross between these new CRVs and then evaluates them for um, the best properties, predictive properties. And then it'll just go ahead and take the top 10 and then it'll make them again for another generation. And so you end up with this like biological mating of CRVs until you end up with like uh, new CRVs with improved properties. But in the end, it takes you a little further away from the original CRV. The second algorithm we provide is called gradient walking. And what this does is allows you to start with a CRV and then walks, takes little small steps. And then as your property starts changing, it'll adjust its walk and then it will walk until it can find a location um, that has a better, uh, what do you call, property. Uh, the problem with this one, right, is that it allows you to get trapped in a local minima. And so you might not be exploring the full area. But the good thing is that you're staying within a, a CRV area that's a, that you specify. So you end up with compounds that look more like the original compound. And the final approach is just a very simple iterative expansion. And so in this case, we go ahead and take the CRV that we start with. We go ahead and ask for everything that's around it. And then for each of those, we repeat the process until we kind of iteratively through generation after generation have now generated lots of molecules. And so these, using these three different types of approaches, we're able to provide three different types of like, uh, you know, generative molecule styles for chemists to look at. So in this case, right, uh, the big question, right, is that even though you can generate hundreds and hundreds of molecules, the, the problem is that you can generate these, but if no one can make them, then it becomes really hard to like uh, to, uh, to show them and give them hope that, you know, hey, here's something cool, here's an idea, uh, can you go make it? And if it turns out it's like a 17 step process, then, you know, that's makes kind of a deal killer. So we ended up, uh, you know, coming with our own um, uh, CDD fast filter. And what we did was we went ahead and just basically looked at all the fragments that are available in Kemble. And uh, we built a filter that you know looks for uh, compounds that exhibit fragments that aren't have, have never been seen before. And we basically start flagging those compounds and adding little you know flags on it. And then we count the number of flags that we see. And then those with the low, you know, lowest number of flags are we consider to be the most synthetically feasible. And then on top of that, we teamed up with a company called Postera. Uh, who's done a lot of retrosynthesis uh, analysis. And so in this case, we can go from a compound to give us uh, you know, exactly the synthetic steps that would be required in order to generate that compound. So, so in this case, now we've gone from hundreds of compounds now to tens of compounds that are you know, actually more synthetically accessible for our med chemists. So after we built all this, we went out and we invited uh, some of our old friends to come in and take a look at it. And so we uh, went ahead and got three med chemists to come and take a look at it. Uh, almost all these chemists have like uh, between 10 to 30 years of experience. Um, and so we kind of just uh, went ahead and picked a bunch of projects. Uh, we generated compounds on them. And here are some of the highlights uh, for them. Like, of course, there are going to be compounds that came out that didn't turn out well. But these are some of the better ones that we're showing today, of course. Um, so med chemist A. Uh, we gave him an MMP9 project to look at. I think this is a covalent inhibitor you pointed out. And he, uh, what do you call it? It generated uh, some simple changes off the original uh, compound. And the cool part was that he noted all three of these uh, were commercially available. Uh, that was one of our filters was we checked to see if they're commercially available. And he said that even though these would not be his first ideas that he would go after, uh, but because these were commercially available, he would just order them and, uh, you know, have them be screened through his assay. And that would give him extra SAR that 
he wouldn't have expected to have. Uh, for Matt Chemist B, he walked a little bit, took a look up at this uh, 5-HT6R program, and he uh, said that um, you know this transformation that was predicted, uh, that was generated by the uh, by the uh, model. He said that uh, removing the phenyl to a methyl uh, is exactly what a med chemist would do. The fact that the predictive activity was still equipotent implies potential for improvement in lipid efficiency. And he said the only thing he wouldn't change would be altering the sulfur at the same time. He, he said instead of creating one compound, this gave him a three compound ideas, which was really cool. And then after uh, on the HDAC4 project, uh, med chemist C said, uh, you know, after realizing it could be synthesized in two steps, uh, after, he said, this is not an obvious replacement. It could work out really well and lead to a new avenue of exploration. Uh, the big thing was this uh, uh, fragment on the end here with the with the fluorines. He's, uh, he was, didn't think this would be uh, something that would be synthetically easy, but our uh, synthetic filters actually showed that uh, you could actually generate this in two steps. So it was very exciting for, uh, for us to be able to show him something that he didn't think was possible, but turned out it was actually uh, feasible. Okay, so in general, the med chemists were pretty happy with the machine learning's ability to aid with hypothesis generation. And, uh, you know, a lot of times these are not ideas that would have been the first idea, but because they were simple or easy to order or easy to make, they could just easily add them into their pipeline to get more SAR information. So we're currently working with NIH. Uh, we're integrating our generative chemistry into their uh, uh, synthesis, synthesis pipeline. Uh, and so they're going to be, uh, you know, over the next year, we're going to be working on that project. And then we have one big pharma uh, who we just uh, finished our deployment at. Uh, so we're going to start working with them on projects. And then we have two other biotechs in the pipeline right now. And so that's uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, of course, special thanks to Matt and his team. They've really given us the, uh, the insight and, uh, you know, uh, the help we've needed in order to move this project forward. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Phil, uh, for giving us a great oversight into uh, some really novel approaches to combining sort of generative chemistry and predictive modeling. Uh, I'm just going to close uh, by talking a little bit about our work um, into how we can actually uh, couple the expertise of, of chemists uh, with these sort of generative chemistry approaches to get the sort of best outcomes for projects as interactively and as, as quickly as possible. And first, I'd just like to start by thinking about some of the challenges we have to routine using sort of generative chemistry methods. Um, what you often find um, is that all the algorithms are, are really great and interesting. They're quite complicated to set up. You really need sort of data scientists or expert AI people to, to set it up and get all the parameterization right. Uh, as we've also heard, um, these methods can also generate very large numbers of compounds very, very quickly. On the right-hand side is an example of an expansion around a single compound with a really very constrained search. And in a matter of seconds, you can go from a single compound to thousands of compounds and exploring the chemistry around that. So very often there's a need to sort of triage very long lists of compounds to find the interesting ones, the examples that, uh, that Phil was able to show, for example. And in amongst that, there are many irrelevant compound ideas. We've heard about synthetic feasibility, but also just ideas that, that aren't likely to be fruitful or interesting uh, for a particular project based on a, a chemist's sort of knowledge and understanding. And so one of the areas that uh, we've been uh, working with is, is finding a better way to interact with generative chemistry algorithms to really uh, get the most from an expert chemist experience, but this ability of generative chemistry methods to rigorously explore a broad range of different optimization strategies. So, as I mentioned, we think it's this combination of generative chemistry and expert knowledge that will really get us to optimal compounds fastest. Um, our Inspira approach uh, links sort of the generative algorithms with the human expert. It removes that barrier to, to entry, to, to getting started, because as soon as you load a set of compounds, it begins to immediately generate, evaluate, and optimize compounds as you work. It then learns from you as you interact with those ideas to propose the most relevant suggestions. So new suggestions are influenced by your interactions. Uh, and this gets that seamless combination of expert chemistry knowledge and AI. So you can sort of think of it, um, 
uh, Nick was talking about having scoring functions, usually represented by predictive models of activity or other properties to prioritize the ideas coming out of the Gen Chem methods. But think of the expert as being one element of that scoring function to sort of drive and, and focus the generative chemistry to explore the most relevant and interesting areas of chemical space while rigorously exploring many different optimization strategies. So we can see that lots of ideas can be generated very, very easily. Uh, the question is how you then go about prioritizing them. And the approach that we take is sort of probabilistic in that the probability of displaying an idea is related to, to two things, its properties, so is there a particular range of properties that you're looking to achieve in that sort of multi-parameter objective as, as Nick demonstrated? But also how similar are those compounds to ideas that uh, have come before that you've already explored? Uh, if they're very, very similar, they're likely to be obvious. You know, you, you wouldn't need a, an algorithm to help you find them. Equally, if they're too different, they're unlikely to be particularly relevant or too big a jump in chemical space. And so you can think about having this sort of hotspot in chemistry space, which represents those most likely to be interesting for a particular project or to a particular chemist. But this isn't necessarily a static picture. Uh, as you work and as you interact with those ideas, say which ones you like and which ones you don't, that picture can evolve. And so it can learn from your interactions to really identify the most appropriate areas of that space. Maybe you are interested in more similar ideas in a you know, late stage lead optimization project, but equally, maybe you are interested in exploring greater diversity and maybe willing to sacrifice some of those properties to get to a new area of chemistry. So this is about guiding generative chemistry methods to, to quickly explore the most relevant areas of chemical space and suggest those strategies that are most likely to succeed. Okay, so it can learn from your interactions. Well, how does it do that? Well, I mentioned the prioritization is based on this combination of property and diversity. Uh, what do I mean by a property? It can be any prediction from a model, whatever source of model you have, or indeed a multi-parameter score as I'm illustrating on the right-hand side. As Nick nicely introduced, uh, drug discovery is about balancing many different properties to get to that right um, set of criteria that will be a high quality lead or ultimately candidate compound. And then diversity is a similarity to previously selected compounds. In our particular case, we're using a, a Tanimoto similarity, um, but it could be any measure of, of similarity. And then essentially what you can do is interact with ideas that are proposed by Inspira, and you can select it. You say, wow, I really like that idea. I'm going to keep it and add it to my data set because I want to consider that later. You can like an idea. This is sort of a weakly positive signal. It's saying this is heading in the right direction, but it's not good enough to keep. You can ignore a compound and say, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not interesting. Or you can reject a compound and say, no, that's, that's garbage. I really don't like that. And that's the most negative interaction you can have. And from those interactions, it can estimate the likelihood that you will respond positively to a new compound given its property and diversity. Um, and this uses a sort of a Bayesian inference approach to, to really learn uh, the most likely areas of property and, and, and diversity space that will, will yield uh, a positive response from you. And so just to sort of illustrate what this looks like in practice, uh, here is an example where um, we're trying to, to maximize the solubility predicted by a, a log solubility, a log S model. Um, and we can start with no assumptions, what we call a flat prior, no assumptions as to what we're looking for uh, in, in a molecule. And what you can see immediately after just five interactions, we've, we've liked a few compounds that have higher solubility, not good enough to keep yet. Uh, we've rejected some compounds that have poor solubility. It's already inferred that we're trying to increase the solubility. This black line is a sort of estimate of the, the likelihood of a positive response. Once you've interacted 10 times, we've begun to select some compounds with really good solubility. It's now honing in on those high solubility compounds. And after even more interactions, it really is now trying to push the boundary and find even more soluble compounds. You can see at this point, we're actually starting to reject some compounds in the areas we were good enough before because we realize that we can get further and further uh, in that uh, to high soluble compounds. And if we look at diversity, here's an example where we were looking at selection from three different chemical series called A, B, and C. 
Now, this is just labeled for our convenience. The model doesn't understand these labels. It just has this diversity metric. And what you see initially, it's not sure what it's looking for. It's sort of bouncing around. But if the user selects compounds from series A and rejects compounds from B and C, what you can see is this quickly begins to separate out and it begins to realize that the user is most likely to respond positively to compounds from series A. It's put series B second most likely and really um, down prioritize series C. And we can sort of understand those relative rankings if we look at that sort of chemical space. This is a, a TSNE space. Here is series A at the top, series B and series C. Um, what you can see is initially the first compounds that come out are from series C because just by chance it's the biggest series with most compounds. But once we start to see compounds in series A, it realizes it's going to bias towards that when we respond positively. Now it's exploring just series A, a couple of B because it's the closest. Um, maybe some of the properties here are are really good and it wants to say, look, I know this isn't the series you're most interested in, but, but maybe check out here because the properties are good. And ultimately, if you look at all the samples in this run, it's very, very heavily weighted towards A, a little bit of B, and very, very few in C. So the algorithm understands where we're trying to focus that exploration. And then how might you actually use this? Well, we think about a couple of different ways that you might want to interact with this. Uh, one is thinking about the diversity, exploring the diversity with an entire data set, a multiple chemical series perhaps, and proposing these ideas um, to you. This is like a, a flow where these five ideas gradually are replaced to explore different series and different optimization strategies that you can interact with in the way that I described. Or you might think about doing this on the level of an individual compound, much more driven by the chemist looking at a specific compound and specific areas that you're looking to modify, a specific group replacement is being suggested here, using the generative chemistry methods to suggest those replacements and then enabling you to sort of walk through that chemical space replacement by replacement. If you want to see this in action, uh, check out our, we our webinar on our website, uh, which will we'll show some, some examples of that in practice. So that brings us to the uh, end of the sort of formal presentation. Um, I can see we've got lots of questions sort of already coming in. So let me just start with the first question here. Um, so this one is is for for Nick. Um, is in your opinion, is generative chemistry intended as a replacement for medicinal chemists? Well, that's a uh, it's it's a great one. It's also a tough one. Um, I would say absolutely not. Um, I think this is really to augment ideas. Um, I think at the moment it's really at a stage where depending on the difficulty of your target, it can perform or it also cannot perform. This is what I tried to say before with the models. But I think in the end, you know, it's it's really there to inspire and maybe because it's it's going into it can go into a space where your usual, let's say, building blocks do not go. And if you're really stuck in a certain area, that can really be uh, something where it can excel. It can also early on, if you combine it with, um, let's say, more library designs or other things, it can really quickly um, get you to points where you can cover the early space with building blocks, but then go on um, further to the next step. So I really see it more in this space and not a replacement. I think it's just, you know, another method if we bring all these pieces sooner or later together then it, it will become a, a stronger um, overall platform but it's clearly in the end the medicine chemist and the cat persons um, are at the center of this yeah i agree completely in fact there's a related question here as well which i'll just go into because i think it it, it goes nicely with that uh, and the question is some platforms aim to be totally automated from design to synthesis and test of compounds but your presentation show that human through active learning is still an important actor to guide the process. What are your thoughts about the all automated versus automated uh, to help humans in this field of molecule generation using these AI approaches? And maybe Phil, you can comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, what do you call it? You totally nailed that on the head with your, uh, with your uh, illustrated uh, example where you're showing that you know, an automated one would end up being in that large green uh, cluster where you may not have, you know, even been able to sample that very small tight cluster uh, that where you showed that the user was actually more interested in that area. Having the uh, intuition of a med chemist and many, many years of, uh, of what do you call experience is kind of what uh, we need to make our tools uh, be able to uh, be in combination with, right? So that's, you know, empowering our med chemists is, is kind of where we are at the stage right now. 
Yes, I, 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 I think I, I concur with, with both of you. I, I'm a very firm believer that the human needs to be part of the loop, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, predictive models are, are great, but as Nick mentioned, they have limitations in terms of domain of applicability. Um, you know, Phil mentioned in terms of synthetic accessibility, and, and there again, there's some models for that now, but they're not perfect. And so really leveraging both the expert who understands the chemistry, the biology, the therapeutic area, and the goals of the project has that strategic overview and combining that with an AI's ability to do a very rigorous tactical analysis of those different strategic options uh, gives you the, the, the best outcomes. It's an approach that we describe as augmented chemistry, obviously related to the idea of, of augmented intelligence. Right, so let's have another one. Um, here's a sort of a general question. Um, is it's basically asking if we can say a few words about model interpretability. Uh, I don't know, Nick, if you have anything that you'd like to say about model interpretability? Uh, oh, that, 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 that will be a very long answer. I can try to be very short. I think personally, model interpretability is, is great to validate whether or not your model actually makes sense, if it has learned the right things, let's say. Model interpretability in terms of, you know, highlighting really which things to change can be very misleading. Let's say there are some papers out there that can be helpful, but I think you have to be very careful with this. It, it, I think one thing that GenCam and some other methods in that space can really make a difference is that the question, you know, do you even need to still interpret if you can see or essentially molecules suggested to you that you can say, yeah, I like this one, I don't like it. And, you know, this is my profile that goes with it. So I think I'm I'm biased on that one, for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's also a, a slight difference between interpretation of these sort of generative chemistry models, which are obviously spotting something in the, the latent space that feels is, is worth exploring molecules in that space. Um, but the other type of model, of course, is predictive models of properties, where what you'd like to understand is what is the structure activity relationship that it has identified in your specific compound that is leading it to think that it has a good or bad property, or, or even informing that design approach around what, what areas you can change to have the biggest impact on improving that predictive property. And so, you know, there's different types of models that have sort of different levels of interpretability. Yeah, we've been uh, just doing some ex uh, exploration around, you know, how can we map our um, our latent vector uh, back to like, you know, different fragments and different things like that. And just trying to understand, you know, of our 384 dimensions, are there key dimensions that are more uh, uh, important? Uh, but yeah, that interpretability between uh, mapping uh, between latent space and real chemical space is a challenging problem for us in our model. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another question here, a couple of questions uh, relating to stereochemistry in your model, Phil, um, and whether uh, they were sort of noting that, that the stereochemistry was not um, uh, not uh, included in your, your your compound structures and whether um, there was a, a reason for that and, and what your intentions are for uh, including stereochemistry in the future. Yes, definitely. Stereochemistry is definitely coming in the future. Uh, you know, this is the first round. We wanted to make sure that we could even tackle the initial problem at first, but yes, for our next generation models, uh, you know, we'll have stereochemistry and we'll hope to incorporate more of this target uh, information as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth. Uh, we've been looking at some of these really cool uh, energy-based models uh, for in adding the ability to create a fixed core uh, generation uh, to our packages. And so uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity and we just need to kind of pick uh, which steps we want to go uh, that's going to have the biggest impact. And a lot of that feedback is going to be coming back from uh, our companies that we're working with and so and our scientists. So it's a very exciting place to be right now. Yeah, very much so. Okay, so um, I have just one more question I think we have time for. Um, so this, I think, refers to uh, to my part of the presentation about Inspira. It says, for the up and down voting, is this on global scoring or local scoring level? Um, in my mind, teams score locally on project basis. Both are relevant, and if teams score, they score especially a specific dimension to get to the full objective. Um, so essentially, you can see or it can be prioritized based on any properties that you want. Um, so a single predictive. Uh, model in a particular property that you're interested in optimizing 
or as I sort of briefly illustrated, uh, a score that represents the, the balance of properties that you're looking to achieve in, in a particular project. So I think that's well, what you mean by a global score covering those sort of multiple parameters that you're trying to optimize simultaneously. So it can work in, in either scenario um, rather than having to focus on one dimension at a time. Well, I'm sorry to those of you who uh, have asked questions we haven't answered yet, but I'm, I'm aware we've reached the, the end of our allotted time. Um, so just wanted to say uh, a very big thank you, uh, first of all, to, to Nick and Phil for fascinating and, and really insightful presentations. Um, and uh, a big thank you to everyone there in the audience. I hope that you found this useful and, and, and interesting exploration of, of generative chemistry. So once again, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at another webinar soon.